Welcome everyone to week nine of the Civic Leadership Academy. Um, tonight we will be hearing from EMS and the Fire Bureau um, and also taking some tours. Um, with that, I will pass the microphone off to EMS. Hi. Thanks for being here. Hi, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Police and Fire uh, Training Academy. Um, the EMS Academy is actually separate from this. We have a uh, facility in the Strip District, but uh, we still do some training here. So my name is Mark Pinchock. I'm the uh, patient care coordinator for City of Pittsburgh EMS. I basically oversee our clinical and medical operations. And um, I'm filling in for uh, Chief Boshin this evening, and I'm going to do uh, your presentation. Um, so what we kind of have in plan for you for the next hour or so, I'm going to give you an overview of the system. Um, after that, we're going to get everyone a little bit of hands-on doing just uh, real quick compressions only CPR. Um, and we'll show you the reasons why we're doing it, uh, starting a big initiative in the city with doing this. And then we have a, a couple vehicles uh, for you to tour, so we'll split two groups give you tours of one of our uh, rescue units and also one of our medic units set up to demonstrate some of our critical care capability. And that will take us up to about seven days. We'll take a quick break and then we'll hand you off to uh, Chief Jones from the uh, fire department. So if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to ask. I want to keep this uh, very informal and uh, Free, feel free to stop and ask uh, any questions anytime. So at BRS, we've really kind of dedicated ourselves. We want to uh, bring state-of-the-art advanced life support medical care and also uh, rescue services to reduce morbidity and mortality to both the residents and visitors of the city of Pittsburgh. And also we have uh, numerous other regional mutual aid obligations that we fill in addition to our uh, homeland security and defense obligations. Um, our bureau, this is kind of our um, outline or command uh, template of our bureau. Um, basically our bureau functions in uh, three divisions. Um, our biggest division is the uh, ambulance division. That's the bulk of the work. Um, we have 13 uh, ambulances. Um, 10 of those are staffed 24 seven and uh, three of those go out of service at 11 o'clock at night and don't return uh, to service uh, to, at till 0700. And that's based just on call volume. You'll show you some of that. So the ambulance version does the bulk of the work of this system. They respond to you know, the bulk of the medical calls. Obviously, you're moving patients to the hospital, um, providing level of care. The second division is the rescue division and that provides advanced life support rescue services in the city. So we'll show you some of the capabilities with the rescue truck we have outside. But uh, we can do vehicle rescue, um, low angle, high angle rescue, water rescue. Um, the rescue division also incorporates several other specialty um, components. Um, the river rescue is a joint police EMS operation. Hazardous materials, which is a joint fire department and EMS operations. Um, we have a tactical unit that we function with the police SWAT team and uh, several other miscellaneous units. So, um, um, that unit does a lot of work too. And then the third division is our uh, training division. That does our uh, in-service training for our personnel. Um, under the new state EMS Act, uh, paramedics have to have at least uh, 36 hours of continuing education every two years to maintain uh, certification. So that division is responsible for taking care of our yearly um, continuing education requirements in addition to uh, training required for all our specialty teams. So anytime you have a specialty team, it adds capability to your system, but uh, there's a burden to that too. You have to outfit it, you have to train them, you have to do continuing training to maintain proficiency. Um, so that division takes care of that. Our staffing, our budget's approximately $14 million a year, um, so we're smallest of the three public safety bureaus. And we recruit the uh, bulk of that through insurance billing um, for ambulance transport. So out of that $14 million a year, um, they have us projected to bring in 12 million for 2015. I think we'll probably bring in closer to 13 million. So at the end of the day, you're only paying one to two million dollars a year for a pretty capable EMS service. We have about 180 budgeted positions, um, 160 of that as paramedics working in the field. And we have um, some uh, command staff, uh, supervisory level personnel, and civilian support personnel um, in that. And we're dispersed at 16 different station or locations through the city. Well, like I said, our, um, our budget for the, this year is about $14 million, and we're projected to bring about $12 million of that back in through insurance billing. Um, they brought our projection down a little bit for this year. That's based on some changes um, in the new health care laws for medical bearing as it uh, relates to uh, emergency medical services. But I think with our call volume, and we've done some things to increase, increase our revenue. Um, I think we'll actually probably bring in closer to 13 million this year, which would be our case. So you really said the residents of the city are really paying $1 million a year um, for this service. 
Um, just kind of our uh, oversight, some part of the command staff, so that's the chief, the uh, deputy chief, um, two division chiefs, one that oversees the uh, rescue division, one that sees the ambulance division, and then me. My role is really to oversee um, all of our clinical medical operations, um, liaison with the hospitals, and um, liaison uh, with the universities and uh, research projects. We do a lot of research. Um, we have some civilian staff support. We have 10 district chiefs, which are your field supervisors. There's generally two of those working per shift. Um, one, we divide the city because of geography, what we call inside and outside. So inside the rivers, which is downtown, um, the Hill District, Oakland, Squirrel Hut, et cetera. And then outside the rivers, which would be you know, south side Carrick, north side, et cetera. Um, just based on geography, that's how we kind of split the city up. So like I said, we have um, 10 medic units that are 24-7. We have three that are only 16 um, per hour. They start at 7 a.m. They go out of service at the 2300. Um, dispersed through about 12 different stations throughout the city. And then uh, each unit is staffed with two personnel. We're, we're, we're an all advanced life support or all paramedic system. So there's different models for EMS. You can have basic life support staffing, which is two emergency medical technicians. Um, a lot of systems around us use the mixed model with one paramedic, one EMT. Um, we're a full ALS system, so it gives us a lot more flexibility, gives us a lot more capability. Um, if we have a sick patient or a multiple patient problem, we can bring the highest level of care to that problem, um, regardless of the number of personnel we can respond to that. Um, so like I said, the ambulances do the bulk of the work with our paramedics. Um, they're all trained to the highest level of certification under the uh, current uh, state EMS act. Um, they carry all the ancillary uh, certifications that are out there, all certified in cardiac life support, trauma life support, um, pediatric life support. Um, all of our personnel are trained in uh, rescue, both vehicle rescue and uh, basic rescue practices. So all of our personnel have a base knowledge level of rescue. Our people that serve on the, in the rescue division or serve on uh, other special units have more rescue training on top of that. But our concept of operation, everyone has kind of a base level and everyone can participate, help out in uh, rescue operations as needed. So as you'll see when we go out and look at the rescue trucks in a little bit, we staff that with uh, two paramedics. That's right. That's right. We staff that with two paramedics, but if you have a complicated or technical rescue problem, you need more per personnel there. And so our other personnel are trained to a baseline uh, in rescue. Um, yearly, um, our system is pretty much at saturation at this point. Um, our call volume rises every year. Um, our assets have been stagnant because of the city's financial issues over the last 10 years. You know, if you remember back in uh, 2004 when the Mayor Murphy took the city into Act 47, um, we lost four ambulances as part of the uh, budget cuts. Um, so we're a little staggered at the moment. Um, we're pretty much operating at saturation as far as call volume, and our, our units are pretty much out on the road pretty much the bulk of the day. So um, we keep up with this, but it takes a pretty good toll on our personnel um, who are working the streets. And we're transporting about um, two-thirds of the calls we go on. We transport pretty much about 40,000 people per year. So like I said, the call volume just keeps going up every year. It's not a problem that's unique to us. It's the same problem they have in the suburbs. It's the same problem we're having in rural areas. Um, especially in western Pennsylvania, we have an aging population. Um, different pockets of the country have populations with more problems. This area we seem to see a lot more people with seizure disorders. We seem to see a lot more people with respiratory issues, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure. Um, so the call volume continues to climb as the population grows and ages. So eventually we're going to need to um, add units to keep up with this. Calls per hour, like I said, we're saturated pretty much. Um, the only break with our personnel kind of get is from like 4 a.m., maybe about 8 in the morning, this breaks off. But you see once you have about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, our system operates pretty much at saturation, settles down a little about 11 o'clock at night, and then picks back up again. So we're a pretty busy uh, system. Um, we have integrated uh, medical direction. Um, we're kind of unique. Um, we have a very uh, close working relationship with the University of Pittsburgh and the uh, Center for Emergency Medicine. Um, the Center for Emergency Medicine is one of the uh, leading agencies uh, when it comes to uh, research and uh, different capabilities in pre-hospital uh, emergency care. Um, there's a residency through the uh, University of Pittsburgh. There's a residency through the uh, 
University of Pittsburgh for emergency medicine physicians. Their residents work in the street with us. So their second and third years, they'll be on a uh, response vehicle and they can respond to uh, higher acuity calls with us. And they bring some additional stuff that under the current state EMS Act, uh, we don't have available to us. So one thing we really need are uh, medications to sedate and paralyze people to do certain procedures, kind of anesthetize them. Under the current state EMS Act, we're not allowed to do that in Pennsylvania. So they can bring that capability to the field. Um, so it just brings another set of experienced hands. And they'll come on higher acuity stuff, such as cardiac arrest, people with severe respiratory distress, respiratory failure, um, you know, rescues with prolonged entrapment, that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing we do is we do a lot of uh, research projects as part of our affiliation with the uh, university. We've been involved in an international research project for uh, resuscitation science, both for cardiac arrest and trauma. Um, it's called the uh, Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. There are 11 sites in the United States and Canada where, that were selected to participate. We are one of them. And we've been doing for the last six years a lot of randomized controlled trials, looking at what works, what doesn't work, looking at what we can do to res improve resuscitation both in the field and in the hospital. So there's trauma studies as part of that. There's cardiac arrest studies as part of that. And we're currently, uh, we finished one of the cardiac arrest trials and we're currently involved in a cardiac arrest trial um, looking at antiarrhythmics um, and what works, what doesn't work. And we had an advantage from that is usually um, two or three years ahead of the curve, we have information on what actually the best practices is and generally we'll implement new standards of care and protocols two or three years before they're published. So there's kind of, a, there's a little bit of work for our personnel to do that, but there's an advantage to that that we can bring a higher level of care. Um, we've done a lot, like I said, a lot with uh, resuscitation research. We're one of the leaders internationally in uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation, um, airway management resuscitation, and uh, post-arrest care. Um, we are one of the first um, EMS services internationally to, intubate, to uh, initiate a program to do hypothermia for people after cardiac arrest. And there's, there's a lot of good data out there that if someone suffers a cardiac arrest, they have an injured brain, um, one of the worst things that can happen to them is they spike a fever or their temperature comes too high. So we had a protocol in place that we would run um, ice cold IV fluids and get your temperature down. They would keep your temperature down in the hospital for the next 24 to 48 hours. And you had pretty much, pretty dramatic uh, improvements in neurologic outcome with that. Uh, like I said, the cardiac arrest has really uh, paid off for us. Last year, 15% um, of all the people who suffered a cardiac arrest in the city um, survived to discharge from the hospital. Okay, so that's a pretty amazing figure. Think about 10 years ago, that number was about 3%. So we've made a lot of strides with that. Uh, if you look at the national data, um, there's a CARES database for resuscitation for Pennsylvania, and I got a type on that should be the 2014 survival. Um, but for the rest of the state, survival is 10%. So we do better than the rest of the state. Um, this is out of the uh, national data, about 10%. So we do better here than you do in other parts of the countries with uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation. Um, generally, this year, data for this year, um, we've, for the last couple months, we've been delivering uh, 40 to 50 percent of the people who suffer a cardiac arrest to the hospital alive. Now, you get people out of that number that won't survive. They'll have um, you know, unrecoverable neurologic injury. They'll have uh, unrecoverable shock or something. But you know, if you have a cardiac arrest in the city, um, we have about, about 40 percent chance is our goal of getting you to the hospital alive. And then after that, it's up to the hospital and the ICU care. So we post, yeah. Explain the chart. Yeah, so this shows um, the percentage of our cardiac arrests each month. This is this year, January, February, March, and April. They get bystander CPR. Um, so this number is low. So you look at last month, April, only about a third of the cases that suffered a cardiac arrest got bystander CPR. Ross means that we got a pulse back at some point. So usually about over half the time, we get the person's heart to beat. And then ROSC ED means we delivered the person to the ED with a pulse. So they were delivered to the hospital a lot. So this is one of the things I talked about. We're going to I'm gonna have some of my, uh, my friends here. Um, we're going to do a little bit of CPR. This is one thing we need to improve in the city. We don't get enough bystander CPR on these cardiac arrests. These numbers should be up 70, 80 percent is our goal. And we're actually in the process with, uh, the, uh, with uh, UPMC. We're going to be rolling out this year a big initiative in the city for doing a lot of uh, CPR instruction. So just out of curiosity, how many people have CPR training or have a current CPR car? Okay, good, about half of you, that's good. So what we're gonna show you a little bit later is compression-only CPR. So we don't need to put you through a big CPR class or anything like that. Uh, we're gonna show you how, what you can do to buy time. So if we get C the CPR numbers up here, my goal is that we're gonna get 20% of our patients surviving to discharge, and that's the goal we wanna get to. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Okay.
We also do a lot of um, cutting and stuff as far as cardiac care. Um, we have several tertiary care uh, facilities in the, uh, in the city and we have an integrated protocol with them. And our goal is that if you're having a heart attack, we get on scene, we identify that, we do an EKG on you, we identify that. We wirelessly transmit that to the hospital. It goes to the cardiologists and the emergency department of phys physicians. They activate your cat, the, cat, the cardiac catheterization labs. And our goal is from when we arrive scene to you're up in that cath lab and your vessels open in your heart is 90 minutes or less. And that dramatically improves survival and outcome. Um, so we work with the hospitals for that. Um, we hit these numbers pretty well. Occasionally some of the hospital partners don't hit it, but uh, we hit these numbers pretty well um, doing that. So we kind of really feel we uh, very aggressively bring a lot to resuscitation science. And uh, for medical emergencies, uh, we uh, take a very aggressive approach of aggressively treating problems um, in core resuscitation areas, such as cardiac arrest care, post-cardiac arrest care, people in extremis, people in shock, severe respiratory distress, having heart attack, stroke. We bring a very aggressive level of care we will stay on scene and fix the problem and then move you to an appropriate facility. And we have a lot of good data that that's um, improving your outcomes in the city here. Our other division is the rescue division. Uh, we have two heavy rescue trucks that are staffed 24-7 with two paramedics. Um, these are also uh, licensed as ALS squad. So two paramedics. These, uh, the paramedics on the rescue truck can do everything a paramedic on the ambulance can do except for transport you to the hospital. So they can get on scene, they can provide care. If it's a really sick patient, they'll arrive on scene and supplement the care. But that's the advantage of us being kind of an all ALS service. We really bring a high level of medical care to a scene. Uh, like I said, we'll kind of show you some more stuff with the rescue trucks, um, but we bring a lot of rake rescue capability. Um, so vehicle rescue, high and low uh, angle rope rescue, so you get these people to climb off Mount Washington and get stuck. These are the guys that go down on ropes and get them. <laughs> that happens every summer. It's going to happen again pretty soon. Um, structural collapse rescue. Uh, we have surface and subsurface rescue capability, building collapse, confined space, and we do a lot of elevator rescue. A lot of old elevators in the city, a lot of them break down. Um, we do a lot of that. So we do a lot of that. So we do about 750 rescues per year um, with these units. And like I said, we have uh, various special units. Um, so we have the uh, river rescue unit that's staffed um, right now with two paramedics and one police officer and dual mission unit. One is provide law enforcement support on the rivers. The other is search, uh, search and rescue, both um, surface search and rescue, subsurface search and rescue with uh, the two paramedic divers. We also. Um, our, the uh, hazardous materials team for the city, and that's a joint operation with us and the uh, fire department. They said river rescue, um, we're in season now, so we staff that. We have two paramedics, one police officer. Our in season is considered May through September. The off season is uh, October through April, and our staffing goes down to one paramedic and one police officer then. But the, these, once again, these boats are state certified as ALS squads or ALS response units. So they have a full uh, set of medical care there, equipment gear, we have two paramedics. If there's an emergency on a boat, a shore, someplace else, we can bring the highest level of care um, to that scene. We additionally have a tactical EMS team, that's one of our newest units. Uh, we have 14 paramedics that went through 80 hours of uh, training with the SWAT team, do another 16 uh, hours of training uh, every, every month. And we function with the police to bring uh, paramedic level care forward in tactical situations. So we support the SWAT team on high risk warrant services, hostage rescue um, situations, and uh, barricaded gunman situations. Um, once again, the primary role for us is medicine, but we're a completely integrated part of the uh, SWAT team. And we have other sp um, specialty uh, operational units we participate in. Um, Pennsylvania Urban Search and Rescue Strike Team 1, that is a regional team for southwestern Pennsylvania, um, can do specialty rescue. Um, Allegheny County Hazardous Materials Team, we also have personnel that uh, participate in a special medical response team for hazardous materials. And then because of the Ebola scare back in the fall, we are the state designated uh, service for Western PA to move um, highly infectious patients. So actually we've been designated by Pima that if there was ever an Ebola case or any other highly uh, lethal or infectious disease, uh, we would be the team that would be called to go out to an outlying layer, maybe go to Indiana County, go to Somerset or something, recover that patient and uh, bring them back to Pennsylvania. So we're the designated team for Western Pennsylvania, or at least Southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, to do that. Like I mentioned, our training division trains our new hires. I mentioned uh, community training, and we roll out a lot of um, 
community outreach training too. So um, there's some information in your pamphlets there if you're interested in us coming out to your community group doing something, we're more than happy to accommodate that. Okay, uh, the other big thing we do is special event coverages. So we cover um, all the mass gatherings, sports events, everything in the city. So we cover the Pirates, the Steelers, uh, we cover um, the Penguins, all the college uh, athletic events, all the college gatherings, um, high school and youth sports. So um, that's a lot of work. There's a lot of these events. An average three more day, I think that's old. I think we cover a lot more than three of these a day anymore. But uh, we bring that level of care once again to all the uh, event venues in the city. And it's just some of the venues that we cover there. Some more of the venues we cover. And we have a lot of different models we'll cover with these. So stuff like the marathon, walks, races. We have uh, a motorcycle unit and also a bicycle unit. So we can get personnel. You know, there's bigger events like the marathon. There's really no way to get an ambulance around that course. So we'll cover that with motorcycles, bicycles, stuff like that. Okay. I don't want to talk for too long. That's just kind of a brief overview of the system, who we are, what we do. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can answer. Oh yeah. Yeah. It sounds like your squads are sometimes busy. Does it create delays in responding to calls? And, and you know, do you keep statistics and what, what kind of statistics do um, you have? There are times we saturate and we're out of units. Um, so there's two ways we handle it. I don't have the exact statistics on that available. Um, if you contact Chief Potion, he might have those. Um, so there's two ways we handle that. The calls when they come in the 911 center are prior prioritized and they get a code of zero through three. So zero is supposed to be an immediately life-threatening emergency. A three is like I hurt my ankle or something, something can wait. So the first response be those three calls will hold for a while until we can get some units available. If we have emergent calls um, we don't have units left for and we feel there are potentially life-threatening calls, we'll request mutual aid from uh, outlying services. So that's the two way we address that right now. But yeah, you can get service delays when the system's at saturation. Yes. Oh, Go ahead. Bring them. Bring them on. Okay. Uh, first, it, uh, yeah. Sorry. First is, uh, does Pittsburgh have a community paramedic program? We are um, starting. At, so there's a program through the uh, Center for Emergency Medicine called Connect, and that is a community paramedic thing. It's a little different model. It's not really going out doing kind of home health care stuff. It's more looking at linking people to social services um, in the system. We through uh, one of our programs are starting into that, looking at addressing problems for like frequent callers. So we get elderly people that we see every other day because they fall and they can't get back up. Um, we have people with psychiatric issues who call frequently. We got people with chronic medical conditions where maybe if they manage those better, they wouldn't have to go in. Um, the problem with those programs right now, you have to get them grant funded. There's not external funding for those like you can't bill insurance for that right now. We're hoping with the uh, Affordable Care Act, the hospitals now have an incentive um, to keep people out of the hospital because they're not getting paid for readmissions or they get penalized. Um, so we're in the, we are working with the, that Connect program and we are looking into um, other avenues for us to get involved in that. Um, and my other question is kind of piggybacking off of the previous question about um, like running out of units and being low on manpower. Um, what would the chant or like what are your thoughts maybe or any ideas on um, kind of not restructuring but maybe adding like BLS units or yeah, like a we quick had response? BLS units. I know firefighters. Yeah, we, we had four calls, EMT but. units back in uh, 1998 through 2004, 20 or so, and that worked very well for us. I know the uh, chief would like to bring that back. It's just we're under the Act 47 restrictions right now. And I think we have support from downtown for that. It's just, you know, budget, budget. I mean, this year we had to take a 5% budget cut. So um, when you're cutting the budget, it's hard to add. But uh, we're looking at different models to add, add to the service. Because if the call volume goes up, you're going to have to add units eventually. Yeah. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Daryl Jones, and I am the fire chief for the city of Pittsburgh. This is our mission. This is the mission of the Pittsburgh Fire Bureau. And I'm not going to read this out to you, but I'll give you a second to read it yourself. Is several things that is very important in this mission that, that we find uh, that I want to point out to you. You'll see fire suppression, emergency medical service, hazardous materials manage, mitigation, emergency management service, and domestic preparedness. We are more than just a fire suppression 
organization. We are an all hazards organization. And what I mean by all hazards is, with the exception with exception with someone maybe have a gun pointed at you and sticking you up or robbing you, by all means we want you to call the police. But for everything else that could be of an emergency or critical situation, from grandma being locked out of the house to uh, weapons of mass destruction being detonated at the point, the fire service is going to be a part of it. Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire is going to be a part of it. Uh, we do a lot of things related to uh, community support and risk reduction. One of them is events like this where I get a chance to come in and explain to you what we do. Uh, each of you have a uh, smoke detector in front of you right now. If you look in your packet while I'm thinking about it, let's just see this. There is a form. Now the smoke detector is yours. <clears throat> Excuse me. All I ask is that you please fill this form out and leave it with me because we do keep track of these who uh, received the smoke detectors. If you need more, you can dial the mayor's 311 line, give them your address, and we will provide you with more smoke detectors free of charge, and we will come to your home by appointment, and we will install the smoke detectors as well. Okay, so please uh, take care of that for me. I appreciate it. Our organization, we are broken down into four districts. Right now, you are sitting in the third district. The first district comprises the uh, north side and the west end, the Sheridan area. The second district is all of Oakland. Uh, the Golden Triangle, I'm sorry, is also in the first district. Uh, second district goes from maybe uh, uh, 14th Street and uh, the Strip moving up and from, I would say, Console Energy Center or Mercy Hospital, moving out towards Oakland, all of that is the second district. The uh, third district is here in the East End. It comprises of East Liberty, Lemington, uh, uh, Homewood, and Wilkinsburg. We do provide fire services for Wilkinsburg. Fourth district is all in the South Hills. As you can see, we have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, actually, we've increased, we have 30 engine companies, 11 truck companies, a mobile air compressor unit, which we call a MAC unit. We have five hazardous materials response unit. We work a 24 on, 72 off shift. And each and every shift, there is a minimum of 163 firefighters on duty. We also have uh, access to a vehicle repair garage, we have a logistics or supply warehouse. We have SCBA repair. Those are the SCBA stands for self-contained breathing apparatus. Those are the air tanks you see firefighters wearing. They are filled with air and not oxygen. Everybody says, what happens? Why are you wearing oxygen? Well, it's not oxygen. It's just compressed air. Uh, training Academy, where you're sitting here now, uh, approximately 20 instructors all together come out here all the time. Uh, I have budget and finance. My chief clerk, Maxine Anthony, she's a little camera shy, so she bailed out on me and she would be in here. Uh, Maxine has been with the department for over 30 years, and I always tell people all the time, she's the real boss. She's the one who's really running the show. I keep telling her she should go get a uniform and take her rightful place. We have, she handles the budget and financing. We have some great uh, personnel for fire prevention, we have uh, inspectors, and uh, we have also have what we call a fire slash arson investigation unit. And our fire arson investigation unit is perhaps one of the best in the world. Let me help put that in perspective for you. Despite what you see on uh, CIS or CSI TV show, about 17%, 18% of all fires across the country can you make a determination on what the cause? And believe it or not, they're not all electrical, okay? So, uh, but here in the city of Pittsburgh, our clearance rate is closer to 80%. So we have, uh, we do a much better job than the national average. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call a fire engine. Now, I know all of you say it's a fire truck. 
but we call it a fire engine or a pumper, okay? It's shorter, as you notice, you see all that, these uh, controls right here, that's the pump, the pump panel, pump controls. It is staffed with four personnel. Its main job is to move water. You will see this particular apparatus hooked up to a hydrant. You will see hoses stretched off of it, and it will be, this crew will be attacking the fire itself. Uh, it's four people on each one of our apparatus, except for the MAC unit, it has two. It is, like I said, primary function is fire attack, and this is the big number right here. It's a half million dollars. And climbing. This is what we call a truck. You can tell it's a truck. We call it a ladder truck. It has the big ladder on the top. You do not see any pump panel or anything like that. This particular uh, vehicle does not carry water. Its primary, it's also staffed with four people, but its primary mission is to ventilate and to do search and rescue. If you saw the big four alarm fire we had last week in Shady Side, I mean, sorry, in Squirrel Hill, and you saw the helicopter was giving you a view from the guys up on the roof. They were cutting holes in the roof to get the, let the smoke out. That was the guys off of the truck company. That's their job. That's what they do. And this one right here cost about $900,000, about a million dollars for one of these. We have 11 of these, and like I said, we have 30 of the engines. Now, Pittsburgh firefighters. Guess be at least 18 years of age. There is no maximum age. There is no maximum age. You have to retire when you're 65. So you could come on the job at 62, you could come on the job at 64 and 366, 64 days, whatever it is, but you're gonna leave when you turn 65. <laughs> the training has been increased. We no longer do six months of training, we do eight. We have eight months of high intensity training. We put out the best firefighters in the world after eight months of training. When I was looking at one of the old pictures out here in the hallway from one of the recruit classes from 1959, and their training was 20 days. <laughs> Compared to what our guys go through and girls go through now, which is like eight months. And the reason for that is because the, the hazards, the threats, our mission has changed. It's no longer about just throwing water on fire. As I stated before, we do an all hazards approach. Upon completion of that training, our firefighters are certified as Firefighter 2. They are certified EMTs. They are basic vehicle rescue technicians, hazmat operations. This equipment that you see the firefighter wearing right here costs about 10 grand, weighs close to about 100 pounds, between 80 and 100 pounds. Add it on. Physical conditioning is a big part of what we do. Our our uh, recruits, we have a recruit class in now. They'll, they started a couple months ago. They will be obviously finishing in about six more months. Uh, they do a CrossFit routine. We had one recruit come on the job, lost 100 pounds in the eight months that he was here. We had another one who came on. Uh, when he first started, he was able to do five pull-ups. Upon his final physical fitness test, he was doing close to 60 which is like a crazy number of pull-ups, you know, so it's just insane. When I was in the Marine Corps, if you did 20 pull-ups, you maxed out. So to be able to do 60 is just an astronomical amount. Uh, here's some statistical information. I don't have the 2014 numbers yet, uh, but the 2009 and 2000 to 2013, you'll see how we uh, things have changed. You'll notice that the number of fires have gone down and they continue to decline. And there's various reasons for that. I would like to take credit for that too, but I can't take all the credit for that. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we do have a pretty aggressive fire prevention program. Okay, And it's hard to measure what the outcome of your fire prevention program. No one calls 911 and says, hey, I almost had a fire, but thanks to this <laughs> class I went to the other day, I knew how to avoid the fire. So 
we, we just know that the numbers are, are dropping. The numbers that increasing is our EMS calls. We assist our uh, emergency medical services, the EMS guys. We're a bigger service. We have more resources. We are trained. We are licensed. And we can respond and get to the scene before they do, in most cases, stabilize the patient. They come along, give advanced care, and transport the patient to the hospital. And as I was saying earlier, when you guys were doing it, I saw you guys had dead people all over my classroom in there. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about the, uh, EM, the uh, CPR. The national average for survival from a cardiac event where someone goes into cardiac arrest is about 5%. Here in the city of Pittsburgh, your survival is 16%. And the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire is a big part of that chain of events, that chain of survival, because we can get there to fibrillate, do CPR, and uh, get you transported to the hospital. And what I mean by survival is people who walked out of the hospital. Not that you made it to the hospital and then died days later. People who actually went home. That's what we consider survival rate. So we're doing pretty good. We're not the best in the country yet, but we're working on it. Uh, service calls, those are the calls, like I said, grandma's locked out of the house, cats stuck in the tree, that kind of thing like that. Uh, yeah, we do get those calls, cats stuck in the tree. Uh, bats in the house, we get those. Uh, uh, Prior to coming to the city of Pittsburgh, I worked for 20 years in Aliquippa with the Aliquippa Fire Department, and one time I had a response for a call that was a snake bite, and I thought it was a lady, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm like, she must have found a snake in her house, a black snake or something, and was messing with it, and it bit her on the hand, and only to find when I got there that she was bitten by a king cobra, mm. which was uh, one of the most deadly snakes in the world, and her and her boyfriend was raising these things and milking them for the venom and, and all that. It, it just barely scratched her and it almost killed her. So yeah, uh, we've seen you get some, when the guy says you need a diary, <laughs> uh, remember, that, when, remember when he said that in the video? I had one, but then I figured nobody was going to believe it anyway. <laughs> so I just quit, because, but you can't make this stuff up, you know, you, you can't do, I just had nightmares about crawling through a smoke-filled room and run into a king cobra, you know, just wasn't going to make my day. Uh, good intent calls, that's calls where people say, hey, I see some smoke coming off the roof, and we go in to check the steam or something like that, you know. So, of course, you also have your malicious false alarms, severe weather. <clears throat> Pittsburgh, believe it or not, guys, is known for severe weather. The last two weeks of May and the first two weeks of June is when we get hit with it hard. All the microbursts, you think about that, what happened like in 1985 with the tornadoes that went through. The tornado that hit uh, Mount Washington, the microburst that a few years ago that destroyed Kennywood, all that happened in that one four week block. So just food for thought as we move on. Uh, special calls, we'll do a lot of those. Those are like the uh, things like for the fireworks details and things like that. Then you have a bunch of other miscellaneous calls that we just didn't characterize. We are a participating department. You guys been watching Channel 4, WTAE News? They've been spending the last month of May, because it's Sweeps Month, beating up all the volunteer fire departments about their training, about their response time, and things like that. And they said, well, another one in the state requires firefighters to be trained. Well, that's true. The state does not require that. But the, the state does promote uh, participating department and become a participating department means that your personnel are certified firefighters. We are 100% certified to a minimum of firefighter two. We are the only metropolitan department in the country right now that's 100% certified. Other departments have plans to become 100% certified. They're doing it through attrition as their older people retire and new people come on. They're training them up, so eventually, over time, they will be 100% certified. We went back and reached and grabbed all these old veterans and brought them up to the certification level. They were kicking and screaming every step of the way, but they did do it, you know. So 
that's, I'm very proud of that fact also as well. We are also licensed emergency medical service by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. You'll see on the side of our apparatus, our rigs we call them, this particular sticker, that's our licensing number right there. Uh, you see it expires this year and we just went through the process of being re recertified and licensed again, went through our relicensing process. So we are completely qualified, equipped, and more than that, we are willing to help. This is what I was telling you about being 16% uh, survival. This is a resuscitation outcomes consortium. They're the ones who uh, were doing the uh, study and determined that we have a survival rate of 16.4%. Discharged alive survival rate, if you look at that second sentence, if you can see it there. And that is something that we are very proud of. We participate in this study because we are finding new ways to be more efficient and more effective in CPR. CPR is changing and we are on the cutting edge of that. If you recall, any of you had a CPR class? Well, it was like you, you pump 30, 30 times, then you breathe two times, and well, we, we are beyond that now. We're to the point now where you just don't even breathe. You just, just pump. And you just pump. And people are happy about that because if you don't have a mask or something, you don't have to put your mouth on somebody you don't know. So, and, and it's turned out to be, it's showing to be that it's much more efficient. When this is adopted nationwide, and which should happen either late this year or early next year, it would be because of the study that the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire participated in here in the city of Pittsburgh. Fire prevention. I am probably the only firefighter in the country who likes fire prevention. I believe preventing a fire is better than fighting a fire. This guy right here, see he's giving me the dirty look back there. <laughs> All right, one of, Mr. Barr, he's gonna run back and tell everybody, Chief says he'd rather prevent a fire. And they, <laughs> Don't get me wrong. You put us through eight months of training down there, hardcore training, coming out to do our job. And then I'll put all the fires out for you. <laughs> yeah. No, whenever the fire comes, if, don't get me wrong, suppression is necessary. But if I could prevent one, I'm a, I'm a lot better off. I think I'm a, I know you're a lot better off anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we have special things that we have to do permits, uh, like fireworks permits. Uh, people want to do special things like bonfires and things like that. You have to come to us. We'll give you a permit for that. We'll make sure that we have people standing by to make sure everything's safe. We also have uh, special events, fire inspections. Uh, we do hazmat tank inspections. We review plans on new construction. Pittsburgh is in the middle of what I would call a construction boom right now. There's apartment buildings going up like weeds throughout the city. Uh, I review most of those plans along with the people from permits, licensing, and inspection, and we make sure that those buildings are going to be safe. Fire codes, and of course we institute a self-inspection program. It is not possible, we don't have the resources to go out and inspect every McDonald's, every Wendy's, every mom and pop pizza shop, you know, in the city. It just can't be done. So we send out uh, forms. These people will do their check off their forms, what they have. We will do spot checks on them to make sure that they're not trying to pull a fast one on us. Every third year, we're going to their place anyway to do a physical inspection, but it just cuts back on uh, our time and it gives them some time to get things corrected. We have a public education program. We have what they call risk watch in our public and uh, parochial schools. We have uh, Risk Watch as a program uh, designed by the National Fire Protection Association. It's designed for kids grades K through six. And what it is is part of the health curriculum. And one hour a month during the school year, these kids are given some instruction on safety. Not just fire safety, it could be stranger danger, drugs, vehicle safety, bicycle safety, the whole nine yards. So instead of us just showing up once a year, usually during the month of October, which is fire prevention month, and telling these kids, you know, stop, drop, and roll, dial 911, that type of thing, There's, this is something that's going, being uh, put forth to them consistently from K to six. That's when they develop their good habits 
and that's something they're going to carry with them for the rest of their life. We also have a programs designed for those with special, special needs, uh, hearing impaired, elderly people. Most of the fires uh, victims are elderly, over 65 or children under the age of 12, and so we try to target those two groups. We do blood pressure screenings, and of course, you recognize the smoke detector program. All right, like I said, uh, we're the only one metropolitan department that's 100% uh, certified. We have received grants over the past four years. Our grants, federal grants that we've received have totaled about $4 million. So that's $4 million that, of taxpayer money that we did not have to use. Well, I should say local taxpayer money. We did use federal funds, we get federal funds for that. Uh, ISO rating. We uh, are now a class two. When I first came to the Fire Bureau in 2007, we were a class four. The ISO stands for Insurance Services Offices. They have 10 classifications, rating from 10 to one. To put this in perspective, there are approximately 40,000 fire departments throughout the country. Of that 40,000, less than 200 are class two departments or less than 300 are class two departments. Less than 50 are class one. We are currently going through a re-evaluation and I am hopeful and somewhat confident that our ISO rating will improve to a class one. What does that mean? That means that the insurance rates that you pay on your, uh, for your homes, your fire insurance rates, should be decreasing. It really affects the commercial properties more than it does the private homeowner. But if a commercial property, a business, can reduce its cost, the costs go down, profits go up, right? The less money they have to spend, that's the more they can keep. So the benefit is that you want to go and tell businesses, come to Pittsburgh, because your costs are going to be less and improving our ISO rating is critical to that. Uh, we began a fleet replacement schedule. Uh, the rigs that you see outside are some of our newer ones and you'll get a chance to see them in a couple minutes here. Uh, and like I said, we have trained all of our officers to Inspector One. So now, what are our goals for the future? Continue to hire to reach budgeted staff levels. I have one recruit class in now. I have another one coming in starting June 29th. We're gonna improve the infrastructure. I know you've seen a story about some of our stations and some of the bad shape that they're in. We're trying to improve that. I have some stations in the fire department that are older than some states in this country. So just, and they're still rolling, so. Uh, improve our fire officer and training. Uh, our officers just went through fire officer one training. Uh, they're gonna be starting fire officer two. The company inspection program, like I said, I'm reaching for ISO class one, and eventually at some point in time, we will be an accredited department. Any questions? Yes, sir. What, if anything, can you share about the Squirrel Hill fi fire and the investigation that's following? The investigation is ongoing. Uh, I could tell you something that you already know that is a really, really big fire, right? So, uh, fortunately, no one was hurt. It was a fire that uh, taxed our resources and it really was a, a stressful situation. I'm just glad no one was hurt. And since it was, there were vacant buildings that were scheduled to be demolished, I think that uh, we kind of come out ahead of the game on that one, so. Hi. Um I have some couple of curious questions. First one is about women, how the women are being represented in the Bureau. We talk about your boss, but I, I was wondering, we don't see like many women like as firefighter or they are mostly on administrative stuff, I don't know. And another one is when you started, you told us about uh, the mission has changed and that now you're the, the, the fire department are take care of more tasks than used to. I just, my question is, if it's Pittsburgh that does 
this new thing, or is a national guideline, something like it's that? It's national guidelines. Well, first, about the, the women in the fire service here. Uh, nationally, women make up about 7% of all career firefighters in the, in the country. Put that in perspective for you. Other jobs that are dangerous, hot, dirty, physical jobs, women make up about 17%. Here in Pittsburgh, I have less than 2%. Okay? Uh, I graduated our first female firefighter in 20 years, last recruit class. I have one female on the list, and I'm praying that she accepts the job <laughs> to start in June 29th. Uh, the problem what happens is a lot of women, they do well on a written part of the exam, they don't do so well on the physical agility part of the exam. Here in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh, if you're a veteran, you get veteran preference points, so they would get 10 extra points on a test score. Previously, there weren't a lot of women veterans, but that's changing now. After being at war for 14, 15 years, we have a lot of women veterans, some of them with combat experience. You know? so, I am trying to attract this demogra demographic to the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire so because it is a predominantly male uh, organization, but these ladies are able to work in a predominantly male organization if they've been in the military, and bless you. Thank you. And no matter how tough the job is, and it can be a tough job, no one's out there trying shooting at us on purpose yet. So if they were able to handle combat, then they can handle this job, and that's what we're reaching for. So I hope that answers. As far as the mission change, yes, that's a national thing. Uh, a lot of that was brought about by 9-11, after the terrorist attacks in 9-11. We are, we just uh, have to, uh, we have to transition to be able to meet the needs of, of our communities that we serve. Um, you mentioned uh, in response to my first question about, you know, Pittsburgh obviously having an older housing stock um, and, you know, you've had uh, fire departments that are older than some states. Um, being that, you know, at, before a certain time period, the way housing was like wired was a little bit different than I'm sure how they do it now. I've learned that there's like certain possibilities of fires or electrical fires in reference to that. Have you seen any trends in, in reference to uh, house fires that have been, um, or do you like keep any information or statistics on housing fires started by these older homes and, and uh, also do you have any like um, prevention efforts going into uh, programs or anything of that sort to kind of like either help people transition or at least let them know of the issues that come from the, this older type of, uh, you know, uh, electrical wiring that may be in their homes? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The older electrical wiring you're talking about is what we used to call knob and tube wiring. And some of us that are older probably remember that, this little, uh, 60 amp shotgun fuses that they used to have and stuff. Well, most of that is pretty much phased out of now. A lot of that is. The problem, most residential fires, which are the most deadly fires, are mostly caused by uh, our bad habits. Uh, we will plug everything into one outlet or string extension cords all over the place have it going in one outlet. We do not dispose of our smoking materials properly. Or we're not very good cooks. And before you ladies get mad, <laughs> let me define by not good cook. I don't mean it doesn't taste good. I mean, we're not paying attention. We'll leave a pot on the stove or something and the doorbell rings or the phone rings and we forget about it and then there's a problem. Then there is what I call stupid people tricks. <laughs> These really get us in trouble. Uh, stupid people tricks include leaving the uh, iron on uh, or cooking when we come home from the bar at 2 o'clock in the morning and falling asleep. <laughs> that does it all the time. Uh, not using stuff properly. I, I had one fire where a guy uh, was doing a girl's hair at her home and he was running out of uh, hairspray. So he had a full can of hairspray in his kit. Instead of grabbing that full can of hairspray, he decided he's gonna get the last little bit out this can. He punched a hole in the can with his key. Well, if you read there, 
it says, <laughs> right? If you read the can, it says propellant is flammable. And you know, you ever see a kid that with a lighter and a spray, hairspray, and it looks like a little flamethrower? Well, this propellant went out, dispersed, and it found the pilot light and they had a flash fire. Fortunately, no one got hurt bad, you know, but that's the kind of stuff that, that we cause problems. So smoking, not using our appliances properly, not cooking properly, stupid human tricks, those really are the ones that gets us in trouble.